Tony, Tony is the president and co-founder of Trading from Main Street. With more than 15 years of professional trading experience, she is a she is a leader in trading education, guys, and she truly cares about her students. Uh, she works in conjunction with some of the world's top financial exchanges. Again, like I said, I love to see traders that are working with the exchanges because they know the experts. The ISC, the International Securities Exchange, the Intercontinental Exchange, the CME Group. Um, she's been all over the place. If you Google her, you will see Tony has been a popular presenter for the Money Show, Traders Expo. Uh, 12 years and is in, um, with both of those and is also an author of several books. Um, Tony, your last one was an award winner, which was yeah. Simple Steps to Trading Discipline, Increasing Profits with Habits you're, You Already Have. And boy, I, I, I don't think I could find a, uh, a better subject for a lot of the traders we have on market buying what they're looking for. So, Tony, you're, you're talking about understanding price action at its purest. It's a great follow-up to look at what we just had with, uh, um, with Sengucci. I think this is absolutely awesome, a great take on, on again, um, when it comes to trading, I, I hear from all of the uh, experts that have been in it for a long time, it comes down to discipline and price action. What is the price action telling you? So Tony, without any further ado, um, take it over. Everyone should be back in their seats. Make sure we can all hear Tony and, and let's get to it. Oh, well, first of all, thank you guys for joining me today. I'm glad that everybody was able to make it out on your Saturday. That was a great presentation by Lucci. You know, when I first uh, came into trading, trading um, trading that that price action like uh, like he does with the ticker you know that was something that was really really popular but as he said you know as a lot of like um, a lot of the computerized trading came in it, a lot of people kind of moved away from it you know a lot of people were looking at the bid and ask prices and trading off of that but you know as those prices got hidden you needed to go back to really watching that ticker tape action and today's presentation it's a little bit of a different take on looking at pure price action you know Lucci looks at it by reading the ticker well I look at it by looking at the charts but you're going to notice that we do a lot of the same type of thing. It's just the way we visualize that action is a little bit different. So what we're going to look at today is reading the pure price action on the charts. I know he mentioned we were going to talk about Fibonacci. I had given them two topics that uh, that I, I gave them a choice between which one do you guys want to go through. And uh, this is the one that was posted on the site. So I, I hope that's what you're here for. If you want some Fibonacci chat, you know, I will stick around for the Q&A and happy to answer any questions there too. And definitely, you know, drop me an email anytime too. And you can contact me directly through my site which is tonyhanson.com so if you can spell my name correctly I'm pretty easy to find out there but let's get going here so what we're going to look at to begin with are basically the concept of looking at pure price action so I'm going to show you a chart here and this is a this is the cable this is a trade that I was uh, looking at just the other day and what you're seeing on here is just the candlestick charts. You're just looking at the pure price action that is taking place here. And I like to use candlestick charts just because they give me a little bit of a, ve uh, a better visual picture for what is going on in the security. So I use the candlestick charts, but I don't do quote unquote candlestick charting. For example, I can tell you, you know, we have we have a hammer down here. Let me grab my ink pen. I guess not ink pen, but here we go. You know, we've got like a hammer candlestick chart and, and that sort of thing. You know, here's another one over here. Those will often indicate that you have a market bottom forming, but it is not the pure candlestick type of action that I'm looking at. And I'm going to show you what I mean here in just a minute. It's getting into looking at a lot of different things such as the momentum and the trend development and what's going into actually building these candlesticks themselves as opposed to what those pure candlesticks are. So the candlesticks I use just because they give me a little bit of a better visual for what is going on with the price action, but when it comes down to looking at price action itself, the two main things that I focus on are the momentum development and the trends development. And you're, you'll find that you know a lot of the presentations that you go to, a lot of the, the websites that you'll read, 
they have a lot of emphasis on using different indicators like moving averages, the RSI, stochastics, you know, commodity channel index, you name it. There are more indicators out there than I can possibly think to, to even list right now. And the thing with indicators is that they're basically all based upon some understanding of price action. That was, that's what goes into the configuration of those indicators themselves. And they all will work at certain times, sometimes better than others. But what I found very quickly when I began trading was that if I was able to understand what was going on in the pure price action of a chart itself, the indicators gave me confirmation for what I was already seeing, but they also would often give me false in false triggers. You know, I would, for example, you know, Fibonacci is one of my favorite indicators to use. And uh, if you're just looking at the pure Fibonacci levels, well, how do you know which one of those levels is going to hold and which one is just going to bust right through it? If you're looking at a 38.2% retracement, for example, as a buy point, looking to get on board a trend that's already in play, well, how do you know that that's really going to hold that 38.2% support level, or it's going to base along it and bust lower, or it'll just go right through it without even seeming to pause at it? Well, that goes into being able to read that price action. So. In today's presentation, I'm going to share with you some of the concepts that I use in reading that price action. And the two that I feel are the most important in determining, making, basically making that judgment call whether you need to be initiating a position at a certain price point or you need to be exiting a position at that same price point, that's going to depend primarily upon these two factors. Now, there are other things that I look at, but for today's presentation, the amount of time we have, I just want to throw out those most important ones because if you don't look at anything else, these are the ones that are usually going to be basically that determination of whether you are spot on or completely wrong. So let's get into looking at first momentum. And momentum is a concept that when I first began teaching, people weren't really very familiar with. And I came into technical analysis from a totally different path than most people. Uh, back when I started trading, online trading was really just getting started. There wasn't a lot out there for how to learn technical analysis. And most of the technical analysts out there focused on the larger picture, looking at longer term trading, a lot of investing, because it takes time you know, to, to create um, the, the charts and to understand you know, the patterns that are going on. And we didn't have as many of the tools that are available now. So I kind of had to learn how to read price action by myself. You know, I didn't have a mentor that was teaching me a lot of the tricks. And early on I noticed that how prices changed over time and the pace of how those changes took place played a really important factor in what type of price action would come next. And as soon as I share this with you, it's it's going to seem like one of the simplest concepts in the world. And it's amazing that when I first started teaching, people just weren't not, they just were not looking at this. They were looking at moving averages and things like that as their indication for, you know, where the market was going. But when you look at momentum and how the, the prices shift over time, that can really give you a heads up for what type of move to expect next. So for example, here's just a, a template that I have used for years and I've never felt a need to change it because it has held up so well over the last decade or two. And basically, what you have here is, is a concept where if you have a stronger than average move in the, in the market, and I usually call these an impulse move, you're more likely to see a more gradual correction take place. Now, as that gradual correction comes to a close and that channel breaks, you are, again, more likely to see a stronger than average momentum move or a secondary impulse move come out of this trading channel and the more gradual correction. Now, as the momentum begins to shift, however, you'll notice changes within 
how those impulse moves begin and how uh, the momentum shifts over time. So when you start to get a little bit of a steeper pullback or a steeper correction, a lot of times that follow through can also shift momentum. And whether or not it ends up being a major shift in momentum, such as we see here with D, where it's a much more gradual breakout than it was coming out of A, depends a lot upon what is going on in the trend itself and where this breakout is taking place in that larger trend. So that's why the second part of today's presentation is going to focus upon trend development. But let's get back to this here just to, to start with. And you'll see here that the slower than average move to the upside where the momentum is shifting on the upside then creates a more rapid breakdown and follow through on the downside. When you have back and forth movements that create something such as a V or an inverted V like this, when you first see that begin to happen, that tends to be an indication that you're looking at a longer trading range or a period of congestion that's going to develop. And as that period of congestion develops, one of the best ways to determine which way that congestion is going to break is to watch the momentum shifting again on the smaller time frame. So within this congestion, if you then see a slower move to the upside, that gives you a heads up that you're most likely to see a breakdown coming out of that channel. So even though this was an uptrend here to begin with, and you're seeing a base or a period of congestion along highs, because of how this momentum changes at these highs, it shows you that you're actually looking at a reversal pattern that is starting to unfold. And now the market is most likely to start to head lower and continue lower probably because again, we have a stronger than average momentum move on the downside. Now let's take this and look at how this looks like on an actual chart. And we are going to go and pull up the Euro dollar here. This is one of those pairs that I like to trade quite often. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples of this momentum shift. Now here, when you're just looking at the daily time frame, it might look a little bit confusing. You know, how do I how do I read this momentum? And you really have it forming on a lot of different time frames. For example, you might be looking at how this entire downside move here compares to previous price action. For example, the upside move here. If you look at this, we have that inverted V pattern that is formed here. What does that tell me? Well, it's more likely to fall into a sideways trading channel. So we ended up getting a lot of congestion taking place over the last couple months coming out of that. But as a swing trader, if you wanted to go and look at this on a smaller time frame, what we would look at are the smaller movements that are taking place within this larger congestion itself. And here you can see I have drawn how the momentum has changed over time. And a great way to kind of make that visualization process a little bit clearer when you're looking at momentum is as it unfolds, basically you can transect the trend movements. So for example, here we have a channel that formed lower heading into April. If you drew a line right through the middle of most of that trading action and compared that to the previous downside action, whether you looked at the two waves of downside here or the entire movement here, you'll notice very quickly that the momentum is shifting and you're seeing that change in pace taking place. And what this told me is that, okay, we are in um, a zone where at this point, because of this momentum change, we are more likely to see a strong breakout taking place on the upside. And for those of you that, that join me on our Friday evening trading groups, which resume next Friday after summer, this is one of the patterns that we were looking at developing, and this is one of the trades that we had because of the momentum shifting here. Now you can have that momentum shift even on smaller time frames as well. And it can be the difference between whether you get a continuation pattern or a reversal pattern. Here for example, going into April, this rally here was one that originally coming into this zone of resistance over here, I was looking for a continuation pattern to develop. Something that could bring it potentially up to this level as a resistance point. However, if you drop down to the smaller time frames, you'll quickly notice 
that the momentum began to shift. We had a little bit of a higher high year, basically creating a trap pattern, pulled back, it did try to pop, created another trap here, pulled back even more sharply, and then congested. And that created that smaller momentum shift here where within the larger channel, we began to see a greater likelihood that this would end up breaking lower and coming back in to this zone of support down in here. So the momentum shifting on the smaller time frames really was a heads up that I'm not going to get that continuation pattern, which would have looked more like this and brought it up to this level. I needed to be on the lookout for some sort of reversal instead. And these momentum shifts happen quite often over time. They can serve as those reversal points such as we see here and over here and here, but sometimes they will serve to create a continuation type of move as well. Most often when a new trend is just getting started. And what you will see when you drop down and look at this price action here on a smaller time frame is that the momentum within this shift is stronger on the downside than it is on the upside. So that tells me that there's a greater risk that this channel is basically serving as the equivalent of a flag. It's just that the momentum on the downside is so strong that we aren't seeing that counter trend type of move that you would typically see with a flag type of action where you would get more of this type of, of a move. And instead coming off of the high, you get the pattern forming like this and then leading to the continuation lower. So a momentum shift such as we see right here will not always lead to a reversal where the channel breaks out on the upside. The momentum within this channel will help give you a better idea of whether or not it's going to help serve as a continuation type of move, such as here and here, or if it's going to serve as a reversal, such as here, 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 and here. Now, when we look at where these momentum shifts are taking place, how the trend is unfolding is also a big factor. Now, within a period of congestion like this, you'll often see two waves of back and forth action. So you'll see the two waves up, two waves down, back and forth within a period of congestion. But to understand how to read these trends themselves, we first need to go back and look at the basics. And this is just your typical trend template that you've probably seen about a million times in a million different forms. What we're going to do today, though, is I'm going to show you something a little bit different. Uh, you know, I do a lot of classes where I teach this basic analysis for trend development, but today we're going to go a step farther and we're going to look at some really tricky trend action and looking at how to read that price action. So here is the core template and we'll just start with this to begin with. And you'll notice very quickly that we have three primary impulse moves to the upside. One, two, three. Now if you're looking at Elliott Wave, they would measure that as one, two, three, four, five to complete the trend. And within this trend action, you'll see two waves of corrective move. And this is something that happens quite often within a trend. For example, we go and flip over here to one of the textbooks, textbook examples of what one of these trend movements can look like. This is uh, the Euro Aussie here. And you'll see very clearly that we have an initial impulse move to the upside, one wave of correction, two waves of correction. So we've got two pivot lows here and two pivot highs. Then we have another impulse move, one wave of correction, two wave of correction, one pivot low, two pivot lows, one pivot high, and then a little bit of congestion over here at what would be that second pivot high there. And then the third impulse move to the upside, and that is the end of the trend. The trend reverses at that point. And this is where momentum now factors in. Because when you're looking at trend development like this, and you have strong impulse moves into the third 
leg of buying here on the upside, let me clear this, when that trend corrects, it can do so in a number of ways, or a number of ways. It could shift the momentum up here at highs, basically putting in higher highs like this, and then break lower more strongly. It could have a pullback here and then change momentum, basically putting in a fourth leg of buying to the highs. Or it could do something more like this, where it pulls back sharply to start with, but because this third leg up was so strong, it has a difficult time holding that momentum. And this could actually be what we are seeing right now take place in the overall market. For example, if you go and take a look at what is happening on the daily time frame of the spider or the S&P 500, we had a very sharp impulse move to the upside that basically concluded a third leg of buying on the daily time frame. Basically, it looked like this. I don't have my chart up right here, but it looked like that. Pulling up into the upper channel, it's a little bit more of a wedge. There we go. So that's basically what the spider looked like. It came up into this upper channel up here, had that impulse move with the Fed announcement, and then pulled sharply back off the high, just like we saw right here on the Euro Aussie. So this is one way that that could play out here at this point. And what you'll notice though, is that because this was a sharp move on the upside, and this overall move here was pretty strong on the upside compared to a lot of the, the previous price action, particularly this last leg of upside, as this corrects, the momentum changes. So even though we have a rapid move to the downside to begin with, it doesn't sustain that move to the downside. Instead, the momentum shifts. And if you look at the overall correction compared to the upside, it is substantially more gradual than this upside move, even though it still is pierced by these smaller waves that have that strong momentum. But it's these momentum shifts within here that help propel those movements to the downside. So this gives you kind of a basic idea of what a core trend can look like taking place in the market. But it's very rare that you're, you're going to see this pure template play out in such an easy to read fashion. Now let's go look at something where we're seeing a little bit of a variation here next. And this is Amazon. And this is a pretty recent chart here that we've seen on Amazon. And here's another variation showing you the three wave trends move to the upside. And when I'm looking at trend action, one of the key features that I'm looking at in determining whether or not a trend is really a developing well is that I can really measure three waves of upside versus saying, okay, well, maybe this is going to have, you know, substantially more than three waves to the upside like that, which does happen, is by looking at the period of correction and not just whether it's had two legs of correction or not. And obviously, if it has two waves of correction versus just one, I have a better chance of not getting trapped on a continuation move. But I also want to look at how long this takes to develop. So for example, this took here a couple of weeks. Let's just say it's two. Two weeks to correct and congest, it's probably about two and a half. Well, the next time around, the next correction following the second wave of buying, you want to last about the same amount of time. So if it's two weeks, you want the next period of congestion to be about two weeks as well. If it's longer, that can change how that trend gets read. For example, if you have a correction like that, and then you have a correction like that, and then another move like that, well, this could be considered one wave on a larger time frame where this is the correction on the larger time frame, this might be only the second wave on that next larger time frame. So if you're measuring it as one, two, three, four, then you're obviously, you're, you're wondering, okay, well, this goes beyond those typical three waves of impulse action, so how do I know when this trend is going to end? That goes into looking at how long each of these corrections took place. So 
here we have one where the corrections are approximately the same amount of time and again we have the two-wave corrective action just like we had on the template. However, we have something a little bit different here taking place because this third leg of buying was a much stronger move than the previous ones. In fact, if this trend had remained regular, you probably would have seen a pivot high take place right about here and then a reversal right there at that point. But the intraday momentum would have played a major role at this time and you would have gone and wanted to have looked for a change in momentum intraday that would have indicated that this was actually creating a reversal strategy as opposed to still showing a strong momentum on the upside. And this was something that we saw again heading into this week as well because a lot of securities had had a strong impulse move to the upside and then they were starting to change momentum like this and we saw this particularly on a lot of the forex pairs where we saw that shift in momentum taking place but when you went and dropped down to the intraday charts there was still slower pullback action slower corrective action within that change in momentum here so I, I wrote about this for, um, I write for Real Money Pro, and this was one of the, the first columns that I wrote about this week, was focusing on this price action, because it was still coming into a lot of resistance at those levels as well. But without that change in momentum within this channel itself, that told me, okay, there's still a risk that this channel could break higher and put in that next impulse move. And that's exactly what we ended up seeing happen. So that change in momentum, again, on the smaller time frames is very important. Now, looking at this particular chart here with Amazon, this extended move here and the increase in momentum at the very end of this move made it more likely that with a correction, we could see those previous levels retested. It's not that it was a continuation of the trend with a real fourth wave of buying it was a continuation basically of the third leg of buying whereby the momentum was just leading to that fourth move which in this case served as a trap and that is very common sometimes a rarely you will see a true fourth wave following a period of correction that is about the same as the previous two it's almost always because momentum was picking up like this and building like that but that's where that fourth leg happens and it's not that it is basically at odds what's going on with the overall trend development it's basically just making sure you understand the role that momentum plays in trend development and trend exhaustion so after that point if you have that increase in momentum and you do see a fourth leg like that then that's where the real reversals will typically start to take place, where you will see that channel from the uptrend actually break. Now here, the momentum was still pretty strong, so even as it turned around, it broke the channel, but it didn't shift momentum strong enough on the smaller time frames to create any real reversal pattern that would create a continuation of the downtrend here. It just served as a longer period of correction in what ended up being um, a continuation of the larger uptrend here. So at this point, let's go look at something that is a little bit trickier and this is going to be oil here so this is just the USO we're looking at United States oil fund here and the, this is one of the markets that I like to trade quite often but what you will see is that if you are looking at that template from the you know typical trend waves you know on how a typical trend develops well how do you apply that to what's going on right here if you're just looking at the pure price action itself, it might seem a little bit tricky until you start to develop a better understanding for how to read this price action. And so I'm going to go and show you something here where I'm going to have those trends drawn on each of these segments of the U.S. Um, oil fund. This is the first move that we saw back here. I'll show you. It's this this first drop right here and then here's the second one right here now when we're looking at it and looking at momentum and the role that momentum plays looking at trend development first of all we had an uptrend that was pulling in 
to the high up here. We had an initial corrective move take place coming off of that high after that little bit of a shift in momentum here. So that actually helped trigger a stronger reversal at that point. Now, early on in a trend, oftentimes this two-wave correction that you see marked as A on the template can have a situation where it can have that shifted channel like you see here. This is the most common place that you will see that happen and it took place again over here on the second trend on the downside as well. But once you get into thinking in terms of three, two, two, three, three, two, and just put that into your head, then a lot of these patterns will start to materialize and make more sense the more experience you have with them. So particularly when a new trend is beginning, coming off of a high, your two-way correction can look a lot like that, whereby it will be shifted on the downside and then it might have a little pause like this and then continue into the second leg of downside. And that's what we see happening in both of these cases here where we have that initial flush. Here is the first correction. It pulls lower. It hits a slightly lower low here. 